So as I was planning the worship set this week, I, I dubbed this Southern Gospel Sunday. So we're doing some, some small Southern Gospel songs this week. There's no reason for that. I just wanted to do that. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to get a bunch of great old songs today. Man, it's good to see you guys. It almost feels like normal, doesn't it? Almost. almost. <laughs> so let's stand. We're going to sing an old song this morning, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would guide her and that you would support her and give her the strength that she needs to meet every challenge that comes her way. Lord, bless her, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. So I guess so that means that she was like 10 years old when we started going here, Chelsea. How did we get so old? Speaking of old, we're going to sing an old song. I saw the light written in 1948. So let's stand and worship this morning.
follow the marks of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I have lost my life to find it again. Ever since alone in that holy place, my master and I stood face to face. I might be out of the mainstream and thinking so, but sometimes poetry says it best, I think. Meeting the master does indeed introduce radical change into our lives. He has a wonderful way of helping us to redirect and to start moving toward the correct goals. And we all do have goals. Whether we sit down and write them out or not, we do have, in the back of our minds, floating around somewhere, goals. We all go through this life with something that we hope for, something that we dream for, hopefully something that we are willing to work for. Uh, there are very few things that just kind of fall into our laps. Most of the things uh, in this life take vision, dedication, and plain old hard work. And that's not just true in the physical realm. That is true in our spiritual lives as well. If we wish for God's best to come into our lives, then in spiritual things, we must have vision, we must have dedication, and we must be willing to put some old-fashioned hard work into our lives. Now, we began last week looking at a man called Abram, later to be known as Abraham. And we saw how God could call people out of even the most ungodly of backgrounds and use them to accomplish incredible things. Now, even if we're sometimes slow in answering his call, he keeps calling because he loves us and he wants the best for us. He puts that, that goal in front of us to be more like him all the time that we can constantly, for the rest of our lives, be moving toward. And, and when we closed last time with the thought that we are, all of us, called by God to serve him in some fashion. And I'd like for us to pick up with that thought today and see how this plays out in the life of Abram and by extension how it's going to play out in our own lives as well. Now, if you're taking notes, we're going to be starting in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, and there are three things that we are going to be looking for in the text that we cover today. We're going to be looking for the clear call of God. We're going to be looking for the clear promise of God and also the clear response to his call. Let's zero in first on the, the very beginning of that, the clear call of God, and uh, look to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. We know that Abram first heard the call of God when he was still living in Ur of the Chaldeans, but he was hesitant in answering that call. Now, just in case you were wondering, his tardiness was not because God was unclear on what he wanted Abram to do. This is not a new call that he is experiencing now that he has moved with his family to Haran. It is the same call that he felt back when they made their initial journey from Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, th this is uh, something that has been underlying his entire existence all of this time, and we know that he spent a significant amount of time in his stopover in Herod, at least until his father Terah had died. Now, I want you to look carefully, though, at what the Lord told him to do. He said, and again, verse 1, he said to Abraham, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Is anything about that unclear? Seems Pretty straightforward to me. And, and if you want to break it down, it was a command that had four parts to it. He was to leave his homeland. He was to leave his relatives. He was to leave his father's house. And he was to go to a land chosen and shown to him by God. That is pretty clear. There was no ambiguity about it. He knew exactly what it was that he was supposed to be doing. And his choice was to go or not to go. To be obedient or disobedient. Abram was not lacking understanding in his life. But for a while, what he was lacking was courage. Courage to follow through on what God told him to do. Courage to step forward into uncharted waters, not knowing exactly what was going to come next, only knowing that God told him that he must go. No, he was not lacking in understanding. It was not unclear. It was out there and easy for him to know what was supposed to happen. And I want you all to understand this. When God calls you, 
He is not in the habit of beating around the bush. He is normally very clear and very straightforward about what he wants from us. And people say, well, you know, I'm just not sure. If you are not sure what God wants from you, you can be sure. Do you know how you can be sure? Anybody? Read the Bible. Read the Bible! Open up your Bible and read it. And before long, you're going to know what he wants from you because he told us in exacting detail what he wants from us. Now, I understand that some people will get their whiny face on and they will say, well, I just can't understand the Bible. And there's a reason for that. Because they go out and they they go to the bookstore and they find the biggest King James Bible that they can find. And they take it home, never realizing that they have purchased a book that is in a foreign language. Because we do not speak King James English. It is a dead language that has not been spoken for hundreds of years. And so when you read it, you're doing mental gymnastics trying to translate it into modern American English. So they go and they get a a book, they get the Bible in a different language from what they speak. And then they bring it home and they open it up to the begat sections. (laughs) Or else they they, they want to read the end of the book first and so they skip to Revelation. And then they scratch their heads and say, well, I just can't understand this stuff. Well, of course you can't understand it when you go at it that way. And when I say, get a Bible and read it, what I am saying is get a translation that you can easily understand. There are lots of good modern American English translations that you can get a hold of. If you're not sure of which ones are reliable, come talk to me and I will tell you. Get a translation you can understand, and then start with the Gospels, and read all four of them straight through, and then read the book of Acts. If you can read and understand a newspaper, then you can read and understand the Bible. The problem is not that we don't understand what the Bible says. The problem is that we don't want to understand what the Bible says because we're afraid that we won't like it. And so then we we come along and and maybe we do get an inkling of what it says and we don't like it, and then what do we do? We try to muddy the waters, don't we? And we work ourselves into theological pretzels so that we will feel less guilty for not doing what we're afraid that God is actually telling us to do. Let me tell you, friends, If you have to go hunting up obscure verses, pull them out of context, and twist them around to say something that they were never intended to say, just to try to justify your lack of obedience to the Lord, then you have a very very serious problem in your relationship with the Lord that goes much deeper than just not understanding. You are being a disobedient child if you are looking for loopholes. Imagine if a husband came home one day And he sat his wife down, and he says, you know, I have been going over our marriage vows, and I made some oaths to you whenever we got married, and I said that I would love you and I would be faithful to you for richer and for poorer. Well, honey, you're not rich, but you're not really poor either. You're kind of middle class. And therefore, I declare our marriage null and void. I don't have to love you anymore. Get out. Well, it might be technically true. Not richer, not poorer. Completely violates the spirit of the thing, doesn't it? It would be ludicrous for someone to do that. And yet, that is exactly the way that we try to treat the scriptures when we don't like what it has to say. Instead of studying to find God's clear call and direction, instead we study it to find loopholes to get out of doing what we know that we're supposed to be doing. Don't do that. Just don't do it. 
You know what God is telling you to do. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And trust that the Lord knows better than you do what needs to happen. And eventually you will get around to understanding and come to like it. Now it's kind of like when you're a child and your parents tell you, eat your vegetables. And I hate them. Eat them anyway because they're good for you. Because you know that they are good for them, right? That's kind of the way it is with us. We, we whine and say, God, I don't like it. And God says, you don't have to like it. You just have to do it. It's good for you. And we just have to trust that it is good for us and do what he clearly tells us that we should. And listen, you might struggle with it for a little while, but eventually you will find out that God was right and you will come to like it. As I've often told you, I didn't like it very good when God told me I was supposed to be a preacher. <coughs> I struggled with it and it, hey, here I am and now I would rather do nothing in the entire world than what he has called me to do. Now, I, I, I certainly don't think that our problem is a lack of understanding. I think that our primary problem is the same as what made Abram drag his feet. A lack of courage. A lack of will to make the necessary changes in our lives that will bring us into full obedience to the Lord. I think G.K. Chesterton once uh, absolutely hit the nail on the head when he said this. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And I think that's exactly right. Let me tell you this morning, if you are a Christian, God has called you to some place of service within his kingdom. What is he calling you to? That's between you and the Lord. But as he calls you, understand that you are faced with the same options that Abram was faced with when the Lord told him to leave his homeland and his family and go out to the strange new place. Obedience or disobedience. There's no gray area in between. You need to stop hiding from the call that he has placed on your life. You need to stop trying to muddy the waters. You need to find the courage to look at his call straight on and then decide, what am I going to do with it? And be honest in your response. If God is maybe calling somebody in this, this room right now to become a preacher, it can happen. No, don't shake your head and say, I'm too old. I, I know a lot of guys who started well late in life. There might be someone in this room that he is calling to become a full-time missionary. There might be someone in this room that he is calling, and as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's someone in this room that he is calling right now to be a Sunday school teacher. And you're dragging your feet. Or maybe a kitchen helper. It's time for you to listen to his call, to get off your backside and do it. God calls all of us. Abram certainly had a clear call, and God has not changed his method of operation from then to now. He still calls people. So Abram had a clear call. Abram also had a clear promise. Look in the, the second part of, of verse 1. It's that part that says, to the land that I will show you. And then into verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Isn't that a great promise? I find it pretty comforting as I look at this. That the Lord did not call Abram to leave his home and his family without any details at all. The call of God on his life came within the context of a promise that he gave to Abram. And he, he promised Abram five things. He promised him that he would show Abram the land that he wanted. So it was the first instance of GPS, right? God positioning system. So he, he would tell him exactly where he wanted him to go. And then he also told him, I'm going to bless you and make you famous. He told him that in doing so, that he would then be a blessing to other people. 
He was told that he would bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. So God was going to be on his side and actively working for him, bringing about blessing not just to Abram himself, but to the people that he interacted with. And he also told him that all the families of the earth would be blessed through him in his obedience to the Lord. And of course we know ultimately that that does indeed happen because descended down from Abram into Israel and eventually up to Mary and Joseph and then comes Jesus, the Savior of the world. God called Abram, but God did not ask Abram to give up his life without giving him certain assurances that he was going to take care of him and his family. Think about how much more difficult this would have been if, if the Lord had just sent out his call to Abram in a virtual vacuum with no other information, no other promises attached to it. Can't you imagine that, that Abram one day is walking along and the Lord speaks and said, Abram, go to a land that I will show you. Period. And Abram says, okay, Lord, where's that? What do I do when I get there? Lord, in the deafening silence, Lord, and nothing else to follow. How much more difficult would that have been for Abram to step out and do that? It, it, understand that what God was calling him to, this is not like throwing your stuff in a U-Haul, piling into a minivan, and heading off on a short trip. He was leaving home forever. He couldn't just call or FaceTime or text. He was going to be cut off from what he knew for the rest of his life. That's tough. And if God had given him no other information, I'm not sure he ever would have mustered up the courage to be able to do it. I want you to understand this important truth. The clear call of God always walks hand in hand with the clear promise of God. Just like he did with Abram. He didn't call him in a vacuum, and he is not going to call us in a vacuum. Along with the call that he has placed on your life, he has given a multitude of promises that will enrich your life and give you the courage and knowledge that you need to move forward into that future. Again, you, you have to open up your Bible and start reading and when you do, you will see promise after promise that he has given to us that help us to follow him without reservation. He has promised that to those who will follow him, he would give the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, patience, joy, peace, hope, and all the others. He promised that he would give strength for today and hope for tomorrow. He promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you until the very end. I think some of my favorites come in the book of Revelation. When time and again at the, at the ends of the letters to the seven churches, he says, and to him who overcomes, which means to, to him who has been obedient to the call that I have placed upon you. And you have not wavered, you have followed me, whatever I've told you to do. And to him, I will give. And seven different things that he lays out. A crown of life, reward after reward after reward in the halls of heaven. The list of blessings and promises that he, he says he is going to shower upon us. Just in the New Testament alone, it literally goes on for too long of a list for me to go through in a single sermon. I could take those promises and I could preach on a promise of God every Sunday for the next decade and still not get through them all. He has given us all kinds of promises that go along with his call. But I want you to get this straight today. If you want the rich blessings of the promises of God, then you first have to deal with the calling of God. God does not toss out his richest blessings to those who are willfully disobedient to him. Do you know what the scripture says that he does to the disobedient? He still loves them. 
But the scripture says that those whom he loves, he chastens. I would much rather have the good promises than the disciplined promises, wouldn't you? His call is there. We have all the ancillary information that we need to support that call and give us the courage to step out in faith and follow him. Which brings us to the clear response to the call. Again, Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram went. I love that sentence, that, that phrase. God called. So Abram went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Remember how I said to some people he calls in their elder years? 75 years old. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem. At the oak of Morah, at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. I, I wish that I knew... What happened to Abram from the time he left Ur to the time you get to verse 4? If I knew, I'd bottle it and make a fortune. Because Abram has gone from holding himself back to a sudden change in verse 4 where he starts doing exactly what God calls him to do. So it's taken quite a while, but he has finally committed himself wholeheartedly to the mission that God has appointed for him. And, and let me tell you, it was not until Abram committed himself to God's calling that the blessings of his promises started to flow. And, and if you do your homework on the text, you understand just how radically Abram's perspective has changed in this time. For instance, if you go to verse 6 and you look at that, he went to Shechem to a place called the Oak of Moreh. And the Oak of Moray was a very important Canaanite shrine. So this was a place where the Canaanites would gather from all over to go and worship a local pagan deity, a local pagan god. And so he goes to this Canaanite shrine at the land of Shechem, and there he builds an altar unto the Lord. Try to wrap your mind around exactly what that means. Uh, put it into a modern day perspective if you could. Uh, Y'all know what Mecca is? Mecca is the, the most important city in Islam, and, and there they have people making pilgrimage there to, uh, to worship all of the time. So, so imagine that we made a journey to Mecca, and right there next to the rock that they all gather and bow down before, imagine that we set up an altar unto the Lord and serve, serve the Lord's Supper. How do you think the Muslims would react to that? They would be happy, right? To say the least. Same thing. Abram goes to the Oak of Moray and he sets up an altar unto the Lord and dedicates it to him. That is about as in your face as you can get. But he's not done. Verse 7, he is obedient, and because of that, the Lord hands over the title deed to the promised land, to his descendants. It would be theirs forever, which, by the way, that title deed was never revoked. It still belongs to his descendants, because God said so. So, so he's been, he has been obedient, the blessings follow, and then verse 8, he goes to another place called Bethel, and this is a place, it, now if the Oak of Moray was, was important in Canaanite life, then Bethel was even more so. 
Because this was not just an important holy site for them. Bethel was the center of the Canaanite pagan religion and also the center of the Canaanite military power. Abram went to Bethel and there he built another altar to the Lord. And he made it a holy place that the Lord subsequently sanctified. That is not just building a church next to a mosque. That is going in the front door, interrupting their daily prayers, and preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified in the middle of it. Abram has not just half-heartedly decided to follow God. He is not shuffling his feet going into the promised land. He is marching in full of confidence in the power of the Lord. And he is not ashamed to let everybody know. The Lord is here. He left Herod with a, a holy passion to see God glorified. And when he entered the promised land, all of the courage that he has been lacking up to this point has finally delivered to him in spades. And he marched into the promised land and he shouted for the world to hear, Look out, pagans! God is in the house! And oh, how we need men and women of God just like him today who are not afraid to stand up and shout it for the world to hear, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. How we need modern-day friends of God, as Abram was, to stand up in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation and proclaim, my God is in the house, and change is a-coming. And when that change comes, when a glorious God sends his glory into the midst of his people and they in turn light the world on fire with the gospel. Now that's the kind of change that this world needs. The question is how do we get there? How can we find such dedication for a passionate pursuit of God? How do we see God come down like this in our time, in our church, a literal, literal revolution against the darkness? I told you, if you want the promises of God to be made manifest in your life, then the first you have to deal with the call of God in your life. And here's how you deal with it. The same way Abram did. Remember that, that sentence that we stopped in in verse 4? So Abram went. How do we get from here to there? We go. We do what God tells us to do. The blessings of God come when we are obedient to God. Abram's clear response to him is obedience. Our clear response to him should be obedience. There are too many people in this world that expect the promises without the work of actually following him. And as a result, they get discouraged in their spiritual lives. And then they think, well, what do I, <clears throat> what do I need to do? Maybe a new Bible. That's what I need. So they go buy a fancy new Bible. And then the luster wears off. And maybe I need to, to listen to some new Christian music until they download a new album. Or, or maybe I need to find a new church. Maybe that's what's missing. And they go hopping from church to church trying to find what they're looking for to make a difference. Understand that you will not find what you are looking for in superficial changes. You will only find it when the difference is made inside of us first. God has called. What have you done with his call? It matters. It really does. The late Peter Marshall was an eloquent speaker, and for several years he was the chaplain of the United States Senate. And he used to love to tell a story that he called the Keeper of the Spring. And it was about a quiet forest dweller who lived high above an Austrian village along the eastern slopes of the Alps. 
And uh, this guy had been hired many years ago by a young town council uh, to clear away the debris that gathered in the pools of water up in the mountain crevices that fed the spring that, that flowed down through the, the center of the town. And so for years, with faithful, silent regularity, the keeper of the spring would patrol the hills. He would remove the leaves and the branches and other things that would fall into the, these crevices, and he would wipe out the silt and that would otherwise choke and contaminate the water. And over time, the village flourished, and it became a popular tourist destination, so vacationers would come. Uh, it, had, it was just absolutely picturesque. It had meal mills that were along the stream, and they just kind of rotate lazily, and swans would float down. And, and uh, so there were lots of tourist things that, that sprung up, restaurants and the such. And uh, years passed, and, and it became quite the place. Uh, there was one evening many years later, though, when the town council met for its semi-annual meeting. And as they reviewed the budget, one man's eye caught the, the line that showed the figure of the salary that they were pay, paying to this keeper of the spring. And so said the keeper of the purse, who is this guy anyway? Why do we keep him on all the time? We don't ever see him. He lives up in the hills. For all we know, he's just sitting up there in his cabin laughing at us, sending him money all this time. And so by unanimous vote, the town council, they decided to fire him and dispense with the services. For several weeks later, nothing changed. By early autumn, though, the trees began to shed their leaves. Small branches snapped off and began to fall into the pools up in the mountains, hindering the rushing flow of the sparkling water. And one afternoon, someone noticed that in the spring that ran through the center of town, there was a yellowish-brown tent that was beginning to work its way through. A couple of days passed and the water was much darker. Within a week, there was a slimy film that covered sections of the water along the banks and there was this foul odor that was soon detected. Now, how many tourists do you think are going to want to come and eat alongside a slimy, slimy brook? Uh, the mill wheels began to move slower as the flow of the water was choked off and finally they ground to a halt. The swans, of course, left the water, and along with the swans, went the tourists. Clammy fingers of disease and sickness reached deeply into the village. And very quickly, the embarrassed town council, they called a special meeting, and they realized their gross error in judgment. They hired back the keeper of the spring and doubled his salary. And a few weeks later, there was a veritable river of life that began to clear up and flow into that village. The wheels started to turn again, and new life returned to that hamlet and house. And the moral of the story, as Peter told it, was always very clear. The faithfulness of one man, even though he might not be seen by others, made all the difference in the world. My friends, in a very real sense, we are the keepers of the spring. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We hold back the dark. The work that God calls us to matters. Yes. Even here in Blue Eye, right. it matters. It is time for us to listen to the clear call of God, to come down off our mountain of excuses and get busy fulfilling the mission He has placed on our lives. Let me tell you, it dazzles my imagination to think of a people of God as individuals doing this, coming together as a church doing this. The sky is literally the limit. Let's get to it. Would you pray with me? Father,
we ask your forgiveness for our willful parents. We ask your forgiveness for our sluggish feet, for our wrong priorities, and for putting off what you have told us to do. So Lord, this morning, give us courage. Take our excuses away from us. And this morning, Lord, this morning, let us be a called people who march forward in lockstep as your power rains down upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to the altar here this morning if you need to come. And as Jacob did of old to wrestle with the Lord, if there is something that you have been struggling with, come and meet him here on our knees. And get it resolved. This is too important to let it go another week. You need to, to get it figured out right now. What he's calling you to. How you're going to respond. Do it right here as we sing. Whatever your need, this is the time that the Lord wants to meet you. If you want someone to pray with you, I'm going to be over here to the side. Come up. I'm happy to pray with you this morning. But most of all, it is so important that you do not let these next minutes pass without bowing before the Lord. Would you come today as the Lord calls you? Would you please stand as we sing. <coughs>
because of all this stuff. The one good thing that comes out is that we get them on Wednesdays. They don't have to. So, just had to embarrass you. We do love you. Just sitting here. And then also we have begun running the buses on Sunday morning for Sunday school. Uh, so if you know of kids that uh, would like to come and be a part of that, they can contact the church and we will get them on the list for next Sunday. Um, of course, I think we have just a couple this morning, but that, that will pick up as well. Uh, and again, tell all your friends and family that they need to come and be here uh, and part of what the Lord is doing in this house as well. Uh, because we, we're still missing some faces. I know some, some folks aren't still comfortable coming out, but uh, remind them too that they can watch us online as well. Um, we have uh, a need, now that I've preached that sermon to you, uh, for a Sunday school teacher. As we mentioned, Brooke is going to be leaving us in just a very short while to go to college, and uh, she has been for a couple of years teaching uh, the younger kids upstairs, and we need someone that's going to be able to step into her shoes and, and take that over. Uh, we could even use a couple of someones, maybe if somebody wanted to team teach uh, like every other Sunday or something like that. We're open to, uh, to whatever we need to do in order to make sure that we are able to be a good gospel witness to those kids that want to come, because... Those things that they learned in Sunday school, they're going to remember those for years to come. All right, uh, other announcements this morning? Yes? Food boxes. Food boxes. See, I'm glad you're here to tell me these things. Uh, there are some more boxes of produce. We gave those away a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Gary and Patty brought some more in for us to give away this morning. So I think we got six boxes full of stuff. Let me tell you, I got one yesterday. The strawberries are absolutely delicious. So uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in there. If, if that would be a blessing to you, or maybe you can't use it yourself, but you know someone that could use it, uh, please feel free to take that stuff, because if it's not gone at the end of the day, it's going to go to waste. Uh, so we'd like to see it all uh, trotted out the door immediately. Yes? Don't forget, uh, if you're taking experience in God, we are meeting today at 5. Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right, and as we prepare to pray too, I did want to mention um, Hadley Fugit is in the emergency room this morning uh, having some issues, and we want to make sure that we, we keep him in our prayers this, uh, this afternoon, but we're going to pray for him this week uh, for our company. All right, would you please stand? And David McLaughlin, would you close us in prayer? Let's pray for Hadley. Ha, ha, ha. 